Chiefs. How you use them. T-minus three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. Hello, hello, hello. It was another crazy week. A lot going on. Uh, today, the biz doc, yours truly, is going to be diving into the aftermath of uh, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, SVB. Also, over the weekend, very interesting in the banking sector that will manage that'll manage matter for entrepreneurs. I need coffee as soon as possible. Um, <laughs> there will be lessons, warnings, and a lot of learnings everywhere for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and leaders. Thank you for being here. Um, even if you're listening to this years from now, there's going to be some stuff to pick up for business, planning, personal strategy, a lot of things. There's a lot of learnings this week. So I'm here with Kellyanne, the Swiss Army Knife, pulling charts, running clips, and watching the chat while the BizDoc talks. Uh, good m morning, Kellyanne. Good morning, BizDoc. How are you? I am doing well. How's the weekend? Uh, it was a, it was a crazy busy weekend. Our good friend Mario and Barbie got married this weekend. We also had Value Tainment and Saucecast on um, on a volleyball in Miami Beach. So it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, special congratulations to Mario Aguilar, longtime Value Tainment pillar of all kinds of stuff, from events to the early sales to. My Marketing. goodness, he's been he's been there from the beginning. Congratulations, Mario and Barbie. And uh, if you know him, send him a tweet. <laughs> so um, we're going to take a couple of questions later today on the Super Chat. So make sure you send those to Kellyanne. She's going to pick them. Be clear, be concise, be relevant to what we're talking about. But happy to ask something that you're curious about and matters. Send them to Kellyanne, and she will pick one. And we'll roll through with it. So let's kick off today with some interesting numbers. I found some numbers <clears throat> over the weekend, a couple things that we're going to cover here, that had nothing to do with um, Silicon Valley Bank. It was kind of refreshing. And so I'm going I'm to look at a couple of those and some application for us first. So here's one. Here's a number. $72.99. $72.99. What is that? Well, that is what you're going to be paying for YouTube TV starting on April 18th. And that's up uh, $8. And YouTube is saying, well, you know, the uh, content costs are going up. Um, we've got stuff going on and, and, you know, yaka, 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 yaka. Well, the price is going up for you and me. And I, I looked it up. I decided, what is the cable price? Because I usually pride myself on, like, knowing what I'm paying for these things whether it's, you know, service for business or at home, I always want to know because things change so much and I just, I hate it when things catch up to me and then I realize, wait a minute, why am I so out of sync with reality here? And cable services national average is $83.35. What that is, is one standard program, standard block that's not a bunch of um, uh, add-ons. And... That's what YouTube TV is. So YouTube TV is $72.99. And I remembered a time when this OTT, over the top, was supposed to cost you less than cable. Because part of cable was you had to put a box in every room, right? Yeah. And if it was direct TV, you had these direct TV boxes that had to go in every room. And they had to put the little satellite dish either on top of your apartment building, <laughs> on the railing outside, or on top of your house. And you had to pay for that equipment, and that's what made it more expensive. Well, all of a sudden, cable service national average, $83, and suddenly you've got uh, YouTube TV right behind it at 72 And I already know what Hulu costs. Uh, Hulu with live TV, Disney+, Plus, ESPN+, Plus, that is uh, $70 right now, $69.99. Um, I think there's a version of it that I don't pay for because I just mute the TV anyway when there's ads. Yes, you can say that. I do that. Um, that's $82.99, and you can get Hulu with no ads and Disney Plus with no ads, but obviously Live TV still has ads, and ESPN Plus, which is Live TV and such, still has ads. So it's kind of a hybrid thing. But um, the issue is we've moved from infrastructure-based providers where you know all the cable companies now, it seems like, 
as more people are what they call cutting the cord, well, they're not really cutting the cord. You're paying Comcast for your uh, internet service, and you and now they've got you where you'd say, well, you want level one, level two, level three. If you got a family and everybody's got Wi-Fi on their phone, and you want to get it HD and have it really look good on TV, and then someone's sitting there on a computer, you know, also watching something, uh, you're going to need you're going to need level three. So the internet part of it is like now it's 50, 60, 70 bucks uh, for the internet to come in. And you, originally OTT was going to be inexpensive. When, as a matter of fact, wait a minute. When I first started Hulu, I think it was $39.99. I think it was 40 bucks. Live TV was a little more. And I think it was five or 10 bucks for DVR. I think that's what I paid. Um, but now you've got, you know, the prices are coming up together. So pretty amazing. Uh, you know, back in the day, you know, you had to have a reason to pick one cable operator or another. Your cable operator, you were kind of stuck with. It was who had the, the, the cable in front of your house or your apartment or wherever it was. And your own other choices was DirecTV and uh, what was the other one, Kellyanne? Dish? Yeah, Dish. Dish. DirecTV and Dish. And what was interesting is DirecTV for the longest time had this inside track. And the inside track was Sunday Ticket. They were the only ones that had Sunday Ticket. Sure, you could get you could get Monday Night Football anywhere. You could get Sunday Night Football anywhere because Monday Night Football was who did Monday Night Football's ESPN, right, Kellyanne? Uh, Monday Night Football is ESPN. Yeah, and then Sunday Night Football was I. It was originally Chris Collinsworth and Al Michaels. That was NBC. Wasn't NBC. It? Yeah. So you could get those, but if you were a diehard fan of Green Bay or Dallas you had to get NFL Sunday ticket. Now, the nice thing is you also got the Red Zone channel. So if you played fantasy football, it would jump around every time some team somewhere was in the Red Zone. And <clears throat> they had a nice hosted channel there. It's this guy with the ears, um, Andrew Siciliano. Really did a great job. Sometimes, you know, when Raider Nation, my team, was just wandering in the desert, you know, uh, looking for a winning season or looking for a place to build the stadium, which ultimately became Las Vegas, you know, I would just watch Sunday Ticket, and I would watch the, the Red Zone channel. But anyway, that was my reason for it. But then all things come to an end. AT&T buys DirecTV probably at exactly the wrong time. Satellites are getting old. They're expensive to replace, and they start losing subscribers. And OTT happens. And then you had this time where OTT was in a inexpensive, but now all the numbers are coming back together. So the moral of the story is, whether it's your cell phone or it's your, your internet provider coming in, or it's you know wherever you get OTT for, you gotta double check everything, because all of it isn't automatically a lock-in the way Netflix in. Because if you want Netflix, you're locked in. And do you get Netflix, Kellyanne? I do have Netflix. Uh, what do you pay for that? Uh, 15 something a month. Yeah, and isn't, there's another I yeah, I just have the standard package, so it's like two uh, two devices, but there's a premium package that's like nineteen ninety nine for like six devices. So that's what a family would use yes. because mom and dad, you have it mom on your dad, phone, brother, sister. somebody has it on an iPad or a Their laptop, TV, yeah. and they've started this thing where they got to know what those devices are because there's no more yeah, password no sharing. Yeah, no more password sharing. Yeah, so it's a pretty interesting. But I thought that was interesting. That number caught my eye, seventy two ninety nine, YouTube TV, and... Hulu also up to 70 bucks. Boy, OTT was supposed to be less expensive. I guess not. <laughs> Meanwhile, what also happened, a number, another big number that caught my eye this weekend, and I thought this was kind of interesting, was $16.5 billion gained by Charles Schwab. Well, wait, wait, wait. BizDoc. When Silicon Valley Bank Fell. I mean, last week we were covering it, and wasn't it the big four banks that kind of swept up the Silicon Valley Bank customers as people were scared of now regional banks, and they went to the big four, which of course is Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, then Citibank, uh, then Bank of America, and then Wells Fraudgo. Um, and by the way, I say Wells Fraudgo out of accuracy, not because I'm picking on their brand. Um, they're doing a fine job of destroying their brand all by themselves. Um, with the frauds that have happened against uh, poor consumers. And probably I was one of them. I had a business once upon a time. Suddenly I had a Visa card in the mail that I didn't open and wow. another account. And I noticed that I was uh, zeroed 
for the annual fee on the visa for the it was like uh, twenty five thousand dollars but it was cow. for the business for business so uh -huh. we had more than enough dollars to support that but i never opened it. i thought nothing of it and i i put it in an envelope and i wrote backup on it i remember it and my business partner at the time i said hey this is a backup it's from our bank and we got the first statement zero used and then the annual fee was zeroed out so somebody opened the card for me and zeroed it. I would later find out, as the rest of America did, that there were sales contests going on at Wells Fraud Go, and they were opening counts for people without telling them. Well, what happened on the one year anniversary of that card? You know, what's the 60 bucks? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I ultimately closed it. We were away from Wells Fargo, but everybody from SVB, I digress. Every, so, in other words, watch and be careful, because even the big four banks, Bad things can be happening, so be aware. So anyway, Charles Schwab over the weekend says that they have recently sw swept up $16.5 billion in customers. And I'm like, where are these customers coming from? It's not coming from the big four. The big four were all talking last week about how they had responded and got customers by serving them during the SVP crisis. Uh, we read about uh, the guys at uh, J.P. Morgan that were doing all pulled an all-nighter 24 and 48 hours these people were working to call people up and saying hey do you have a payroll account what's up with silicon valley bank we're here to help you bring your stuff over here we'll get you covered so at the moment of need they were doing good things so you heard about all that so this money can't be coming from the big four because the big four were picking up stuff so where did it come from well i dove into it a little bit and near as i can figure out you know where it came from regional banks and it came from a thing called the contagion effect remember they were talking about oh my gosh we can't have a run on the banks we can't have that happen if we have a run on the banks we've got trouble well hang on a second the run on the banks would have caused banks to fail because in our fractional banking system which means they only have a fraction of the cash on hand that's represented by the deposits because it's been loaned out in that sort of a situation, um, the regional banks must have been losing customers. You know, regional banks that aren't having any trouble, so we're not talking about First Republic or any of the other ones that are out there. Apparently, other regional banks must have been losing customers over this week as people said, wow, I'm with a regional bank, maybe I'll move out, even though it wasn't SVB, maybe I'll pull out of this regional bank and I'll go over to one of the big four, or hey, I'll just move it to Charles Schwab. So they got $16.5 billion of new assets. So I think that's what happened. The nearest I can figure, and um, if you have news on this, throw it in the chat and Kelly can tell me, but um, I have a story about regional banks because I was with one. So once upon a time, the BizDoc babe and I were looking for a bank in Texas, and Legacy Texas Bank caught our eye. <clears throat> they had nice private client services, and we went in, ch checked the bank out, looked at stuff, and they had a bunch of very nice benefits in there. If you had certain balances, they would credit back ATM charges everywhere, even if you went to Las Vegas and went into a casino where the casino charged you like eight bucks to take money out because I needed, say, money for the valet or something, that eight bucks came off. They, uh, they would credit all that back. So they had a lot of nice benefits, so I said, well, let's go, let's do it. And we were with Legacy Texas Bank for a lot of years. Uh, they had, again, pr private client services. We were on a first-name basis with the people at our local branch, and more importantly, a first-name basis for our daughters. Uh, Bailey, the golf girl, and Brooke, the soccer fiend, Brooker, I call her, they, um, they had their own accounts. And Bailey was out there babysitting, and um, I was also getting a lesson in babysitting. She would get like 60, 70 bucks to babysit for like four hours, like multiple kids, you know, like two or three kids. And I'm like, wow, that's like 15 bucks an hour she was getting. That's, that's pretty good. There's your federal minimum wage. <laughs> And so she would go in there and make deposits because we are savers. You know, we, we focus on saving and we have a money charter at our house. That's right, the BizDoc and the BizDoc Babe, we have a money charter that is on the wall like a constitution. And our money charter is, is this. It first is number one, give to God. Number two, save versus spend. 
Number three, education is a priority. Number four, travel and experiences are worth paying for, but save up and pay cash. And finally, number five is you don't necessarily need more stuff. Consider all of your big purchases. Do you really need it? Is the timing right? Can you get it on sale? So you don't automatically need more stuff. Don't satisfy wants, satisfy needs, and then save up for special wants, but process it. So that's point five. You don't need more, process it. And so that instilled in them the spirit of saving, and I appreciated it that they could go into that branch and make the deposits of babysitting money or whatnot, and they were greeted like a customer. So that was the beauty of the regional bank. And then along came Prosperity Bank. And Prosperity Bank came and bought Legacy Texas Bank. So poor little Legacy Texas Bank gets rolled up and bought. And the transition, to say the least, was a disaster. So here's an example of the weakness of regional banks. I don't know how much IT staff Prosperity had or how many transition people they had. I have no idea. All I know is that my Legacy Texas app didn't work anymore. The app that they sent me for Prosperity, I had trouble signing in. Once I did, all my accounts weren't showing. Numbers that were in there, I said, that can't be the freaking balance. And I went through like a week of this, and it was really annoying. And they changed how they were managing the branches. And then when COVID hit, they managed, and I was talking to friends in Dallas, they managed differently compared to other branches. And by the way, Kellyanne, if there was any business that was already set up for COVID, it was your local bank branch. Because you walked true. in to see the teller and they were already behind Plexi. Three inches of bulletproof plexiglass, right? Yep, yep. So it's like the, the local bank branch was all set for COVID when COVID happened. They were ready. Well, they would, this branch would be closed and that branch would be closed. There's just a paper hanging on the window. And I'm like, I was very frustrated with prosperity. Now, I know they were managing COVID and lockdown, but we were in Dallas, Texas. And as you recall, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, was not, you know, like somebody we know, the governor of Michigan, who shut down everything and, you know, and offered to do bad things to you if you were caught going to your mailbox without a mask. Not the case in Texas. Nonetheless, I thought Prosperity as a region bank did kind of a poor job of that. And so I fired them. And I went to J.P. Morgan Chase, Chase Private Bank. BizDoc Babe and I went in there, looked over everything, moved everything in there, and we were with a major. Now I look back and I'm kind of glad I'm with a major. But there's a learning and there's an application for the small business person that I think is in here. So anyway, long story short, we move it all over there. Uh, we get assigned a, you know, a local private banking person and then a big private banking person so that depending on what you're doing, you got people. But my kids go in there and it's not a first name basis. Um, it's different. It's a national bank and it's got some, some turnover. Our core people are there, but it's just not, it's not that same local home feel. But I've got the strength of being in what is arguably the number one bank in America now. This is J.P. Morgan Chase. So the lesson that I have for you all, and I do this, even though I have account with J.P. Morgan Chase, I have a small consulting business on the side, and I have that with a separate bank. And the reason I do is I want a backup plan. Not if J.P. Morgan fails, but we live in a world today where there's bad people and hackers, and hackers are coming from states, not like the United States, states like Romania, like China, you know, enemy states that are out there that are, I shouldn't say enemy states, but aggressive states, state-sponsored, you know, hacking and things happen, and they're, gonna, they're trying to get power grids, and they're trying to get banking. So I want to have two. So even if mighty J.P. Morgan, all of its resources and security that I know is there, because they tell us all about it, um, even if they had something, I want a plan B. And if you're a small business, you should have a plan B. So here's BizDoc's advice for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and leaders everywhere, and that is have a second checking account. 
and maybe just pay your rent, one big check a month, one big transaction a month, pay your rent out of that. And then the other one, do for everything else. And it's already set up in advance that you can move money back and forth. And have an emergency plan. If there's a hack attack or something happens to this bank, you can get to this bank. And you can move money around. You're already paying the rent out of this one. You can move money around, point that to ADP or Paychex or whomever you're using for your um, uh, payroll, and you can get your people paid. Remember, that was one of the things that uh, everybody talked about. Remember that, Kellyanne? That um, during the SVB crisis, a lot yeah. of companies were worried about what? Payroll. Got to make payroll, and their money was trapped over at SVB. So two accounts, that's the, the advice I have for you. Meanwhile, another number came up over the weekend that I saw. So beyond the $16.5 billion that Charles Schwab garnered, and I would say Schwab earned that, by the way. Sure. You know, the regional banks, maybe there's a little bit of panic, and they didn't deserve to lose clients, and they're, and they're being a good regional bank, but people were nervous, and they moved it to Schwab. Schwab has certainly got a lot of services out there to earn people's business, and they wouldn't go there if they didn't have certainty. But we have just learned that certainty has nothing to do with tenure in banking. Um, Tenure meaning like teachers that have tenure, like you, oh, you have five years, you're a tenured teacher. Well, um, in banking, apparently, even if you have 166 years of tenure, um, things can go bad. Wow. And so I read this week, after the 16.5 billion number, this other number catches my eyes, 17.3 billion. By the way, everything in banking starts with a B. Banking and insurance, it all starts with a B. Billion this, billion that. But I read, you know, Credit Suisse, which I'd read on Friday, was, um, you know, having its troubles, had come to the microphone, admitted it had troubles. Stock was trading at an all-time low of a fairly embarrassing $2.44, I think, on Thursday. So while um, the aftermath on Friday when the regulars took control of, um, you know, SVB, you know, you had the poor folks at Credit Suisse saying, yeah, you know, maybe us too. And they began these discussions on what do they do? Well, over the weekend, UBS, you know, I think it's United Bank of Switzerland, I think it is, uh, for a mere 3.3, $3.1 billion, bought Credit Suisse in the middle of hell. Wow. And it was hell for Credit Suisse. Wow. Um, and by the way, they're a 166-year-old bank. Credit Suisse is a 166-year-old bank. And in the smoking crater that became Credit Suisse, $17.3 billion in bondholders will be wiped out. And a bond hold is a way that you can invest in companies through stocks and bonds. And the government over there was pretty, pretty tough on it. And they said, no um, investors on these bonds, those, those are the investors. They took a risk. They're not being bailed out. See ya. Wow. $17.3 wiped out. And all of that gets taken um, right in the shorts by those poor folks. Wow. And then um, some of them are sovereign funds. I read that Saudi royal family had like $1.1 I believe, of that. So there is a lot of big funds out there, too. But there are there is average investors that could have $100,000 or $200,000 in those bonds that are now wiped out. And now um, UBS owns the bank. And what's really, really interesting is I, I want to look at something here. I'm going to look at the history of the two. Do you have the chart? Uh, there's a chart about the market value of the two big Swiss banks. Credit Suisse is the black and UBS group is the red. And you can see, if you go back, go a little bit to the bottom so we can see the years. There were years there. There they are. So you see right after the crisis of 2008, 2009, and what this graph is showing, if you're driving or you're just listening to this, uh, let me explain the chart you're looking at. It means in 2008, 2009, at the time of the crash, the, the, the market cap for UBS and Credit Suisse was roughly the same. And the chart shows they were in the $60 billion range of total market cap. And then over the next several years, the lines separate. They tend to follow market trends, but they get farther apart as UBS goes up to $70 billion, $65 billion in market cap. But 
poor old Credit Suisse starts sagging down to 30 or 4 billion in market cap. So the lines start separating. And then just this past January, before the crisis happened for SVB, and in the background, we would all soon find out that Credit Suisse had a problem. It was a $10 billion market cap for Credit Suisse and over $70 billion market cap for UBS. So UBS is suddenly seven times the market cap size. So what this shows you, over the, over the time that these lines are spreading apart, there's a little, and we'll go into the history of Credit Suisse in just a second, because that's a very noble, wonderful history, and an entrepreneur that found it that I'm going to talk about here in a second. But it shows you that you go bankrupt gradually, then suddenly. Ernest Hemingway wrote a book called uh, The Sun Also Rises. And in that, there's a dialogue between two characters. And one said, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. And that's usually the case. I mean, you, you mean UBS and SVB were going, having trouble, excuse me, Credit Suisse and SVB were having trouble in the background. And we now know it was getting worse. And then suddenly there's a spark or an event or something, and that pushes it over the edge. Well, you know, it wasn't just social media and venture capitalists tweeting that caused the bank run on SVB. Yep, that may have been the death shot. That may have been the knockout punch. But they were also upside down on those, um, uh, on the bonds they had. And that, that, that was not the fault of venture capitalists. That was not the fault of a run on the bank. That was a dumb decision some a couple of years prior to make yield on extra deposits they have, and they bet wrong, and then they didn't have a chief uh, risk officer for eight months, and so, you know, there's a lot of things that happen. Add all those things up. Each one of those things was a gradual issue for SVB. Well, similarly, there were gradual issues happening for Credit Suisse, and Credit Suisse, check this out, um, it was founded way back 100 and 66 years ago by this guy. Uh, there'll be a picture here for those of you that are watching. Um, for those of you that are listening, I will just describe for you a man in a suit from 1866 with a big beard, looking very distinguished, black and white picture that would be typical of that time. And he is Alfred Escher. And in 1856, he said, with a lot of entrepreneurial spirit and pride in this country, he said, We've, we are a, a nation of mountains, and we need to build out a railway network to get us around these mountains. And he basically founded uh, the build-out of that, and that became what would be known as Credit Suisse. On the other side, six years later, UBS is born, but UBS is different. UBS was a roll-up of... Um, 370 separate institutions over 160 years, culminating in the merger of Union Bank of Switzerland and Swiss Bank Corporation, keeping the name Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS. And during the financial crisis of 08, UBS actually got a big bailout. And then um, there, I do not believe Credit Suisse got a bailout. But after that uh, 2008 financial crisis, um, Credit Suisse had a tough time, and UBS kind of found its way forward. And so the decisions that were made went, resulted in a bankruptcy that went slowly, gradually, then suddenly. So let's talk about that a little bit, what it means for you and me. We were just talking at the beginning, and I did this deliberately. I chose that, um, that comment on um, OTT and cable for a reason. Things can creep up on you. And in business, a lot of things can creep up on you. And if you're a business or you're an entrepreneur and you found something, you need to know that your team every day or at one special meeting a month with you, you question everything. Is this still the best uh, liability insurance for us? Is this still the best deal with shipping? We're with uh, you know, uh, UPS. Is there a better deal even through FedEx ground? 
always asking the questions and then challenging yourself. Do we need that right now? Oh, we want to get new computers and bigger displays. Okay, I can see bigger displays. People can see it. But are people thinking about it? Are people looking at it? And then decisions you make with customers. You start allowing your salespeople maybe to discount a little bit. And what happens is when times get tough, all of these things add up. Expenses that are higher than they should be because no one's paying attention to challenge them to earn your business and get you the best deal that you can. $5 a month matters. You have to treat it like that. You then take a look at, you know, the pricing. Are you, are you there where your competitors are? Should you be 2% more because you're delivering quality and are your salespeople selling that? All of these are things that add up. And I was reading about bankruptcies over the weekend, and they say bankruptcies have been gradually, then suddenly. So gradually, there's what's called the expense or the gross profit effect. Discounting, not charging enough. That's the gross profit effect. And then all of the expense effect. We talked about that. Um, people asking for assistance. You're growing, and all of a sudden, everybody wants an assistant. And people say yes. Well, now, wait a minute. Why can't one assistant handle four people in a couple departments? And what does each person need done? There's all those effects. Those get compounded by a market downturn or a competitive strike. And people say, well, we'll get through this. And you as the owner, what do you do? Maybe you get a credit line at the bank. And suddenly you're carrying 50 grand on the credit line. And uh, well, that's okay. It's a hundred thousand dollar credit line, but yeah, but now you're 50 grand in debt and you're paying the interest every month or maybe even interest and a little bit of amortized payoff. Do you see that would be known as a gradual step. And then maybe you say, well, you know, we'll, um, we'll get a bigger lease. We'll get a bigger place and we'll just, uh, believe we can grow into it. No, you have to be prudent. Does your, is your momentum validate that? Is it the right decision? Maybe you need to sell the dream to customers and you need a better place. And that's all part of getting a better price for what's going on. All of these decisions will leave you as the pinch. In the pinch, the economic pinch, when that all happens, it's going to leave you sitting there all by yourself. And by the way, and picture this also on a personal level, if that individual is you and you're buying clothes, you're not paying attention to your cell phone bill, you're not paying attention to what you pay for OTT, and you can have expenses going up. And then you're deciding that you need more take-home pay, so you stop saving in a 401k that was offered by your company, which is pre-tax dollars and, and, and should be an easy decision. Uh-oh, all of this comes together and it's gradual and then sudden. The sudden part is when a, an economic thing happens. You're laid off of your job in the middle of COVID and it takes you 90 days to find another job and you had barely that much in emergency savings or you didn't even have an emergency savings. Boom, you're nearly bankrupt, except for a government check that comes in. You're almost personally bankrupt. You're on the edge. Your car could be repossessed. Now I know you're gonna tell me, well, no, during COVID they suspended the um, you know, repossessions and you know, landlords couldn't do that. Okay, well, what if it's not COVID? It's just a, a, a regional hit that, that takes. You live in New Orleans and Katrina comes in and wipes out your two dry cleaners and it takes four months for the city even to get back to just something that looks like normal daily life, even though there's a ton of rebuilding that has to do. There's no government check for that. You know, you're hit. So the economic hits happen and you can't take the blow and then you go suddenly into bankruptcy. That's exactly what happened to SVB. That's exactly what happened to Credit Suisse. Now, Credit Suisse didn't declare bankruptcy and, and the regulators didn't step in, but they were on the verge and there were all these discussions happen and the government of Switzerland has even said, hey, you know, UBS, you have to carry the first five billion of ultimate loss, if there is ultimate loss, and we may step in with a backstop or a bailout, but we don't want to do that, and you're taking the first amount, and the bondholders are wiped out. Suddenly, rational voice from a government, and that government of Switzerland. Well, SVB took that punch, and they couldn't take the punch. You know, the bank run happened. Why did the bank run happen? Because they'd done all these gradual things, and suddenly they're trying to get their 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 butt out of the ditch. There you have it. 
Don't be that company. Be prudent at every moment. Be a planner at every moment. Be eager to find savings at every moment. Because you know what those savings add up to? You know what a little more margin adds up to? A little more profit. So that you can turn around and reward the stars in your business when your competitors are taking the shot. So excuse me for getting a little, you know, animated here today on this, but I believe in the Hemingway quote, you go bankrupt two ways, gradually, then suddenly. You know, um, there's also um, a lot of pain. You know, you, you're going to make a lot of pain on customers, customers that needed your product. Now you're not there to provide it. Families of your own business. So now, now your name's on the door of, your name's on, not on the door, your name's on the wall as a list of Another business owner that could have avoided it but caused a bankruptcy and hardship for the community. You know, there's a, um, a documentary out, um, Gradually Then Suddenly. Um, what city was that? Um, was that Detroit, the Gradually Then Suddenly documentary? I think so. I think so. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Kellyanne. It was Gradually Then Suddenly, the documentary about the city of Detroit and how it ended up in this horrible financial situation. And it has been like a canary in a coal mine, meaning a signal for other communities that are out there that may be faced with these kind of things. And so there you have it. Um, there is even a documentary out talking about how one of the nation's proud cities uh, went bankrupt and all the things that uh, happened to it. So, you know, you hate to see it, but anyway, 17.3 billion in bonds wiped out. They dodge a bullet on bankruptcy, but there's a lot of hardship and pain in that. So you don't want to be that. So let's see. Um, do we have any questions? Let's see if we've got a couple questions. So we've got uh, from Anthony Huh, credit union versus traditional bank in this climate. Your thoughts? Credit union versus traditional bank in this climate. Uh, credit unions are normally a little bit more, uh, more stable, you know, and so I can't speak to any particular credit union, but if you're with a credit union, here are some benefits. Here are some benefits. Credit unions are generally through employers or affinity groups, like you are a veteran of the U.S. Navy and you have the, uh, I think it's called Navy Federal Credit Union et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And credit unions usually have much better rates on savings products like CDs and better rates on car loans, boat loans, things like that. And so I think what, um, what I've seen often is, is that credit unions, if you can qualify to be a member, because remember, you gotta be a member of like working for this company or maybe you're with this uh, labor union or you're part of, you get out of the armed forces and you get access to USAA or whatever it is. Um, I, I tend to have a very favorable view of credit unions, but do a little research on the one that you're talking about you know, in your area. But um, my choices would probably be big four banks and, um, uh, and credit unions. So I, I, would, I would have a favorable view of it. Um, Chase Gordon wants to know where you get those shirts, BizDoc. Oh, where am I getting these shirts? These <laughs> shirts are part of the BizDocs 20 year Formula One collection. And many of them have come through, um, you know, uh, teams. I've got several from uh, Williams, the old Williams team, new Williams team is owned by a, a private equity firm now, but that even have the people's name on it. So you may see me up here with a Williams shirt that says Pete or Dominic, and those came from people that actually worked at the team. And it all started when um, I would wear them doing case studies because I like to reference Formula One as a foundation of the elite performance. Formula One is the top of motorsport, the top of technology, the top of strategist. And so if you're really good at what you do and you have to be super good, you can make it all the way and work for a Formula One team. And so I also like the stories that come out of Formula One of champions, repeat winners, and the small team that steps up um, 41 year old Fernando Alonso is stepping up this year with uh, you know, the Aston Martin team, which is a surprise to everybody, but they've done phenomenally well the first two races. I love those stories. So I would buy some of the shirts, but then people saw me wearing them and they would send them to me. So that's where these come from. So this isn't NASCAR. We're not sponsored by Red Bull here. 
This is a Red Bull <laughs> shirt from, I think, four years ago. And I, I rotate through them because it kind of became, as BizDoc did case studies, I just wore a different shirt for each one of my case studies because that was just kind of my shtick, kind of my thing, kind of the BizDoc brand. But uh, thank you. you for asking. Um, we got one more thing we're going to go to today. Very interesting. Um, and we may have one more question. If we, if we have time at the end, we'll do one more question. So if you have any other questions, send them up here. And I'd love business application questions. Maybe you're a small businessman, entrepreneur, thinking perhaps about coming to the Vault or the Sales Leadership Summit, which are incredible programs um, that are put together by Valuetainment. And, and Sales Leadership Summit is coming up in a little bit. And if you and your sales leader um, are looking to up your game, you may want to come check, the, check that out. And so uh, go check valuetainment.com website and see that because it gives you a lot of stuff focused on sales, similar to what I'm talking about, focused on applications. So the 1987 to 2022, how long is that? That's like 40 years, almost. 40 years. 40 years. So 87, so 97, 07, 17. You know, 35 years, 35. to be exact. So 35 years, CDs have won every year on sales over albums. Mm -hmm. 2022, it has reversed. Believe it or not, more vinyl albums were sold in 2022 than CDs. I wow. thought this was so interesting. Wow, old is new. Well, first of all, you go to buy a, a laptop now, there's no more CD player. Nope. They're not in there. They assume you're going to connect to the internet and get all the software through the internet. Microsoft Office you need, you get need a browser, you know, Windows comes built in with the browser and that's all you need to go to all the stuff you need to load up your laptop. Not a plug for Microsoft, that's just the way it works. <laughs> um, but old is new. And what was really interesting to me is that just what a comeback vinyl is making. Um, you know, the BizDoc babe knows that I want to build a listening room at home and I want to put in um, Watt puppies. And you can go look on those, see if you can find a picture of these. What is it? Um, and probably you'll understand why the BizDoc babe is saying no. But I want to build a listening room with a turntable for vinyl and the Watt puppies because the warmth and clarity. Um, that you get out of vinyl, um, I think it's W-A-A-T. Hmm. Yep, anyway, we'll, we'll find it, we'll, we'll show you guys. Anyway, they're really amazing majestic speakers that are, that are sonic purity, if you wanna think of it that way. But anyway, um, so vinyl, has come back because in certain ways, digital, um, there you go, there you go. I found it, I found it, I'm sorry. Those monsters, <laughs> the ones that look like R2-D2 standing <laughs> side by side. Yep, Wilson Audio Watt Puppies. Wow. Um, yeah, you put one on each side of the room and then you know, no one, you can't hear anybody when they call you for dinner. <laughs> um, maybe that's why the BizDoc babe is against it. Oh. So I can say, I didn't hear you till the third time you called. <laughs> Every man's perfect excuse. How do you know I called you three times? <laughs> but anyways, very interesting things. The warmth of vinyl provi provides just amazing quality in terms of sound, especially if you have a good system. And check this out. Heavy metal band Metallica just bought a vinyl factory in Virginia that has been pressing their records and other records for the last 15 years, and they have... Um, you know, bought that because they're pressing other people. So they're realizing, well, not only does it protect because their demand is way up for vinyl, not only do they want to protect it so that they can have their stuff. In other words, if they don't want the thing to go out of business. And if they own it, they kind of protect a key supplier. Um, reverse integration, that is called. Um, <laughs> but they're also looking to make a buck on everybody else wants vinyl too. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever ventured into your parents' attic or your grandparents' attic and... Uh, I have. Found their vinyl collection to find out what they were listening to? I have. We recently raided my grandmother's closet and found a bunch of vinyl that was like worth a little bit of money. My mom's a, a musician and a singer. And uh, um, I just gave Mario a, metallic, uh, a Metallica album for uh, vinyl for his birthday. 
My brother puts them, uses them as art and puts them up on the wall. Was that your, you had a grandmother that was listening to Metallica? No, 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 no. Metallica I went and found and bought oh, okay. that one for Mario. That was not in my grandmother's right, attic. Right, because you're, you're about to win the, uh, the coolest grandma in the house <laughs> contest. Definitely not my grandma. Sorry, grandma. You see grandma going, well, Metallica Black Album was legendary. You know, <laughs> no. you know that. But um, so, I, I, so I asked myself, okay, is there a chart for vinyl? I went and found a chart. The top 10 vinyl albums of 2022, number one was Taylor Swift Midnight's. And she had another one in the top 10, Folklore. Harry Styles, Harry's House is on there. Um, there were two on there from Tyler, the Creator. You know, Call Me If You Get Lost and uh, Igor. But you know what else was on the top 10 for 2022? Fleetwood Mac Rumors, which I think was dropped in 1978. Can you check that for me? Or 77. And The Beatles Abbey Road, which I think was dropped in 1968. And Michael Jackson's Thriller. I have an original pressing, an early pressing of Fleetwood Mac Rumors, and I have a, a uh, second, third pressing of Beatles Abbey Road. Wow. And so that's in the top 10. So don't, don't ever let them tell you that old rock stars go to the old folks home. No, they, they keep getting royalty checks. But what I think is really interesting about this is this kind of shows you um, the, the interest in nostalgia and the interest in, in look back. And if you have a business that can do that and provide a little bit of um, little bit of retro, maybe it's handwritten notes that you send out to key customers, not an email, a handwritten note that you send out. Or you actually maybe pick up a vinyl album that said, I want to be doing business with you longer than this album's been around. And you give them a and you give and you give them a repressing, you know, of Fleetwood Mac rumors. I love that. Um, I, I think uh, you can think about that. But anyway, I just thought this was a very interesting stat that kind of shows you sometimes old becomes new again. It doesn't necessarily die forever, and so I think the message is clear there. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Let's take a look. Think what I've do we got, got? I think I've got one for you. Um, uh, Noah McCormick asked a rhetorical question. Tom, are we going to be riding horses again in 10 years? If so, do you have any horses for sale? So he wants to know if we're going to be riding horses again in 10 years. Um, well, I think if the wrong person is still president and nuclear weapons go off, we, oh, may, be, we may be with stone chisels reinventing the wheel because everybody else is gone. And um, I'm not joking about that. I hope... Cooler hens prevail. Are we going to be riding horses again? Well, you know, the, um, it would certainly be green transportation, you know, and I think there's some people that want to put us back on horses. But uh, no, don't think so. Anyway, um, if you liked all this, this you can find, if you could pop this up, valuetainment.com. Yeah, some of the stories that I have here, there's coverage there. There's also authors, including myself, contributors at valuetainment.com. So, Go to Valuetainment.com, be a subscriber, become a Valuetainment Insider. A whole bunch of Valuetainment gear there, information of events such as Vault coming up in the fall and Sales Leadership Summit, which is coming up very, very soon. And if you are an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, business leader, small business startup, even if you only have one salesperson, someday you want that to be 10, I'm sure Sales Leadership Summit would be um, interesting. And even if you're listening to this years from now, you could probably get... Uh, as Sales Leadership Summit evolves, I'm sure you're going to be able to get recordings and lessons from it because our objective is to support free enterprise, capitalism, and entrepreneurs with messages to help you go farther. So check that out. You can also check out my columns there, the BizDoc 411 every Monday, and Tom's Take when I have thoughts and longer form articles. Until next time, Tom Ellsworth, the BizDoc, and I hope I left you better than I found you.